In the last screencast, we talked about measurement. And in this one, we are going to be talking about how we use those measurements in terms of their accuracy, their precision, the number of significant figures, and different kinds of calculations we can do with measurements. Accuracy is the closeness of a measurement to the correct value. So let's say you were measuring something with a ruler and its actual measurement was say 5 centimeters and you measured it to be 4.95 centimeters, that would be pretty accurate. You're really close to that correct value. Whereas precision is the closeness of a set of measurements relative to each other. So if you measure that same thing with the ruler and you measured it five times, maybe the first time you got 4.95 and the second time you got 5.1 and the next time you got 4.99 and then you got 5.05, .05, those would all be very precise because relative to each other, they are very close. Here's an analogy using a dartboard. On this dartboard over here on the left-hand side, we'll consider the bullseye to be the correct answer. All of these darts are hitting the bullseye and they're very close to each other. So they have high accuracy and they have high precision. Over here in the middle, these darts are not hitting the bullseye. So they're not very accurate, but they are very close to each other. So they are very precise. And then over here on the far right hand side, these darts are all over the place, right? They're not very accurate because they're not getting anywhere near the bullseye and they're not very precise because they are not close relative to each other. When we are measuring in a chemistry class, we commonly use tools like rulers, balances, graduated cylinders, and thermometers. And those measuring devices place limits on how reliable our measurements are. There's always going to be some amount of uncertainty in our measurements. When one student reads a graduated cylinder, they might not read the exact same measurement as another student. They might have slightly different measurements. For example, here is a picture of a graduated cylinder. Now, in order to estimate how much error is possible in our measurements, we have to look at the major scale divisions and we have to look at the minor scale divisions. So in this picture here, all right, my major scale divisions are 80 and 70. The minor scale divisions are these tiny little graduations, which look like they're like one. So this would be 71, 72, 73, 74, and so on. When we measure the liquid in a graduated cylinder, we have to measure at the bottom of this bubble, and that bubble is called a meniscus. So we want to read from the bottom of that meniscus. And in this case, it looks like the bottom of the meniscus is right about 76. When we express how much uncertainty is in a measurement, it's often represented by this plus minus symbol and then the amount of that uncertainty. So for this graduated cylinder, I would express my measurement as 76.0 plus or minus 0.5. Now I will explain here in a little bit why we have to say it's 76.0, but notice the plus or minus 0.5 milliliters is because that is half of the minor scale divisions. Remember that the major scale divisions were these big numbers, 70 and 80. The minor scales were these single digits here, 71, 72. And so half of one is 0.5. So that's why we express this measurement as 76.0 plus or minus 0.5. In other words, we could be off by plus or minus 0.5 and it would still be a reasonably accurate measurement. Now we can determine the amount of our measurement error by calculating something called percentage error, also simplified as percent error, and this determines the amount of accuracy in an experimental value. In order to calculate percent error, what we'll do is we'll take the experimental value minus the accepted value divide that by the accepted value, and then take all of that and multiply it times 100. Sometimes we'll get positive numbers or negative numbers as our answers. The negative answer means that your experimental value was lower than the accepted value, whereas a positive answer means that your experimental value was higher than your accepted value. I'll explain in an example. What is the percentage error for a mass measurement of 17.7 grams, given that the correct value is 21.2 grams? So in order to calculate percent error, we need to take the experimental value, which in this case is 17.7 grams, and subtract from that the accepted value, which in this case is 21.2 grams. So this is experimental minus accepted. And then we're going to divide all of that by the accepted value of 21.2 grams. Then we take all of this and multiply it times 100. That's what will give us our percent. 
If I take all of these numbers and plug them into my calculator, I should get an answer of negative 16.5%. And what this negative right here means is that my experimental measurement, the actual measurement that I got in the lab, was lower than what I should have gotten. So if I should have gotten 21.2 and I actually got 17, that's a little bit lower than what I should have gotten. And it's lower by about 16.5%. When I'm making measurements, it's important to know how to measure them properly. All measurements contain a known amount of digits plus one estimated digit. So if I was measuring with a ruler and I was trying to measure the length of this nail, notice that when I take the nail and I begin to measure, I need to make sure that my nail is lined up at the zero mark, right, rather than at the beginning of the ruler because that's not where the increments begin. And then I look at the very tip of my nail, and I've zoomed in down here so that you can see that, so that I can actually make a good measurement. Now most students, when they read this, will look at that and say 6.3 and that is wrong. Okay, 6.3 is an incorrect measurement because if you notice this tip is actually a tiny bit farther than 6.3. It's actually somewhere between 6.3 and 6.4 and so we need to notate that estimated digit in our measurement. We know for certain it's 6.3 but it's actually a little bit farther and so we need to guess how much farther it is. And so a more accurate measurement is going to say 6.35 because I think it's exactly halfway between 6.3 and 6.4. Another student might look at that measurement and say, well, I actually think it's 6.36 because it looks like it's a little bit more than halfway, and that would still be okay. Now let's reconsider the graduated cylinder from the previous slide. When I look at this measurement, I may think that this looks like it's exactly 76, and so I would write 76 as my measurement. But technically, if I use the measurement of 76, this first digit would be my known digit, and this last digit would be my estimated digit. So what I'm advertising to the person reading my measurement is that I know that it's at least 70, and I'm guessing it's somewhere between 70 and 80, and my guess is that it's 76. Whereas what I'm actually able to read is that I know for certain that it is 76. Right, and I'm guessing or I'm estimating that it's exactly 76. And so that's why it's necessary for me to put point zero. Because again, another student might read that and say 76.1, but I'm going to read it and say, well, I think that's 76.0. And so this point zero is my estimated digit. Let's say that I'm looking at a measurement and I would like to determine how many significant figures are in that measurement. In order to do that, I'm going to use something called the Atlantic Pacific Rule. If I look at a measurement and there is no decimal, meaning that the decimal is absent, then I'm going to use the Atlantic rule. If I look at a measurement and there is a decimal, or the decimal is present, then I'm going to use the Pacific rule. Right? Notice the letters down here, A, absent, A, Atlantic. Right? P, present, decimal present, P, Pacific. Some examples. Let's say I have the measurement 3,000. Right, there is no decimal present, so I'm going to begin counting from the Atlantic side, and that is the right side of the measurement. And I'm only going to start counting the numbers when I hit a number that is not a zero. So I'm actually going to skip all of these first measurements, and that would only have one significant figure. Whereas if the number had a decimal point, mathematically they are the exact same number, but scientifically they are not. When I look at the number 3,000, and it has a decimal point, I'm going to start counting from the left side or from the Pacific side. And again, I'm going to begin counting when I hit a number that's not a zero. So the very first number I come to is three, and that's not a zero. So I have to count that as being significant, and I count everything after that as being significant. So this value of 3,000 has five significant figures. Here are a few more examples. How many significant figures are in each of the following measurements? All right, this one, very first one, 804.05, has a decimal. So I'm going to begin counting from the Pacific side. That's the left side of the number. And I'm going to begin counting when I see a number that is not a zero. So start from over here. Very first number that I come to is an 8. And I count every single number after that. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 means that this has five significant figures. All right, this kilometer measurement has a decimal present. So start counting from the Pacific side. Begin counting when I hit a number that's not a zero, so I can skip these first two and begin counting right here. One, two, three, four, five, six significant figures. 
That last zero counts because I had already begun counting with the one. 1,002 meters has no decimal, so I'm going to start from the Atlantic side. And I'm going to begin counting when I hit a number that's not a zero. So one, two, three, four significant figures. All right, 400 milliliters, no decimal present, so start counting from the Atlantic side and begin counting when you see a number that's not a zero. So these first two numbers I'm actually going to skip and I'm going to begin counting right here. And so that one will only have one significant figure. 30,000 centimeters with a decimal, which means I start counting from the Pacific side and start counting right at the very beginning because it's a three, and that will have five significant figures. This kilogram measurement has a decimal, so I'm going to start counting from the Pacific side, and I'm going to skip all of these zeros because I don't want to start counting until I hit a number that's not a zero. And then I count everything after that. So all of these numbers here are significant and that would mean that that measurement has six significant figures. The purpose of those significant figures is to advertise to your reader or the person that is reading your data what type of measuring instruments you were able to use and the amount of precision or accuracy in those measurements. Once you have the measurements, then you'll need to be able to do some calculations with those measurements. When you're adding and subtracting significant figures, the answer has to have the same number of decimal places as the measurement with the least number of decimal places. I will show you an example of this on the next slide. When you're multiplying and dividing significant figures, the answer will have the same number of significant figures as the least significant measurement. Whichever measurement had the least amount of reliability is the measurement that you have to use when expressing your answer. Once you determine what position is your last significant value, if the numbers after that are greater than 5, you'll round up. If the numbers after that are less than 5, you'll round down. And if the number after the last significant spot is 5, then you have to look at the previous number. And if it's odd, you round up. And if it's even, the number stays the same. Here are a couple of examples on how to apply those significant figure rules. Let's say I was asked to calculate the quantity 87.3 minus 1.655. If I plug those numbers into my calculator, I actually get the answer of 85.645. But now I need to determine how to express that answer with the proper number of significant figures. Since this is subtraction, all I need to pay attention to is decimal places. This first measurement only has one decimal place. The second measurement has three decimal places. I want to use the measurement that has the least number of decimal places, which is this one. So I want to express my answer of 85.645 with one decimal place. So my final answer would actually be 85.6 centimeters. Here's another example. Polycarbonate plastic has a density of 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. If I had a photo frame that was constructed of two 3 millimeter sheets of polycarbonate and each sheet measures 28 by 22 centimeters, what is the mass of the photo frame? So let's do a little bit of thinking here. I've got these sheets that are 28 by 22. So I could easily calculate their area. If I want to calculate their volume, I need to know how thick they are, and they're each 3 millimeters. But these measurements are in centimeters, so I need to convert these millimeters into centimeters. So this is equal to 0 0.3 centimeters. And there are two of them. So as far as the thickness goes, they're actually 0 0.6 centimeters thick because there are two of them. So from here, I can calculate the volume of those polycarbonate sheets. So 22 centimeters times 28 centimeters times 0 0.6 centimeters gives me a volume equal to 396.6 centimeters cubed. And then notice that problem also gives me the density as 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. And now I can just use my density equation and plug those values in. So mass divided by density. Density is 1.2. Mass is what I'm solving for. Volume, 396.6. Cross multiply in order to solve for M. And I get mass equals 443.52.
Now that's the answer that you would give in a math class, but in a science class we need to make sure that we express that answer with the appropriate number of significant figures. Because we were doing division, mass divided by volume, or multiplication, right, 396 times 1.2, we need to express our answers according to the measurement that had the least number of significant figures, which is this one right here. So this measurement only has two significant figures, and so our answer can also only have two significant figures, which means I need to round it to this point here. When I round it to that point, I don't want to completely drop off all those numbers and just call it 44, because there's a big difference between a mass of 44 and a mass of 443. So looking after this dashed line, this 3 is less than 5, so I'm going to round that down to 0. And so this becomes 440 grams. Notice that this answer has only two significant figures because there is no decimal place, so I cannot count that 0, and I have two significant figures in my answer. The last section of this chapter deals with proportional measurements, and measurements can either be directly proportional to each other or they can be indirectly proportional to each other. A measurement that is directly proportional means that as one measurement changes, the other one changes at the same rate. Now mathematically, we can describe that by using this proportional sign, and this is saying x is directly proportional to y. Or we can write it in the form of an equation where k is constant, some constant value, and x is divided by y. So anytime you have two measurements, x and y, and you divide them, if you get the same answer every single time, then that is directly proportional. When I graph two measurements that are directly proportional to each other, the graph will always appear as a straight line. So mass versus volume of aluminum, when graphed, I get this nice straight diagonal line. Mass versus volume is actually the same as saying mass divided by volume, which is density, and so this graph for aluminum is actually a graph of aluminum's density at various masses and volumes. Measurements can also be indirectly proportional to each other or inversely proportional to each other. If a measurement is inversely proportional, then as one measurement changes, the other changes at an opposite rate. So they change in different directions. Notice mathematically they can be described two ways. Again, here's our proportional statement. Y is proportional to 1 over X or mathematically, that k value, again, is a constant value, is equal to x times y. So if you have two measurements, x and y, and you multiply them together, you will always get a constant value, k. And when I graph something that is inversely proportional, I will always get a curve. And specifically, I will get a curve that looks like a hyperbola. So here is a graph of the volume versus pressure of nitrogen. And notice that as the pressure increases, as I go from, say, 100 to 200 to 300, that the volume is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down, and they are changing in opposite directions.